Hello, here we go. Welcome everybody. This is COVID Culture Conundrums, the final session, and we are talking about leadership and legacy, which sounds pretty grandiose, right? Um, but trust me, today we're going to drill down onto some really important uh, tactics and strategies that are less grandiose and more practical. Uh, so this is a pretty important session because it's going to be giving you some very hands-on things that you can do to really advance your leadership as you go forward through this ongoing, insert adjective, pandemic <laughs> that we find ourselves in. Uh, feel free to pop into the chat box what you feel proud of this month. Get some nice serotonin happening for the whole group. Uh, so that we can relish in your success and you can share your success with others. Um, so serotonin is the feel-good well-being biochemical. We're going to talk about how to be a drug dealer and some of that just shortly. And sharing what you're proud of and what you want to be recognized for is one of those ways to go about it. If you don't want to brag about yourself, brag about your team or your organization. I know everybody in Australia tends to shy away from big noting themselves being the tall poppy syndrome problem altogether. Okay. Uh, Carrie says, working from home past two weeks, third week, and have managed to engage my team and support them to remain focused and motivated. Yes. Well done, you. Proud of Melbourne Storm. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Uh, Cassia says, large, hang on. Russell says, large projects being completed, progressed. Woohoo. Wallaroo Ferry and Grain Export Facility. That's cool. Those are big projects. Uh, restarting professional development initiatives for myself. Good on you. And welcome, Courtney, and those who've just joined. Okay. Um, keep sharing into the chat box. I do read all the comments. They give me a boost. They help me contextualize what's going on for you so we can stay relevant. Okay. So let's get into this final session. As I mentioned from the beginning, this is a little bit of a taste of amplifiers, which is my high level leadership program from leaders across different sectors, where we come together quarterly and once a month on webcast to really advance our leadership, to really get down and proactive and to execute on our intentions. So it's not just learning and navel gazing. It's about, right, we learned something about culture, say, for this theme. Uh, for this quarter's theme, let's implement and experiment and see how we can track and progress against that. Uh, I'm pretty excited about Amplifiers. It's been running for a year and a half, and I've just done the planning for next year. And the quarter that starts next week in November, because we have our next immersion happening next, next week, is the theme of Project You, the Leader. So we're going to do some introspection over the summer about who we are as leaders and what it is that we need to extend, progress, and develop in our quest to be the ultimate. <laughs> Just kidding, no one's questing to be ultimate anything. <laughs> but we are endeavoring to progress our leadership. Uh, so I will talk with your permission at the end of the call today a little bit about amplifiers. I'm not gonna spend hours talking about it. It is a special community, it's not for everyone. And if you feel called to end burnout, stop burnout from happening for you or for your team, to accelerate your results in whatever area, uh, be that in culture or in some other performance area, this is for you. Um, and the other thing we do in Amplifiers is talk about leading impact. So it's not just about getting stuff done, it's about impact. Okay, so what we're talking about today is about leadership and legacy, how to be an energy broker. This is like one of my most favorite topics, by the way. <laughs> so excited about this. Four systems that drive positive behavior, and skills yeah. audit. Was that a question or is that somebody who's not muted? I'm going to mute you if I find you are unmuted. There we go. If it is a question, unmute yourself and ask the question. <laughs> okay, uh, so lots of content today. Feel, be ready to take plenty of notes. Um, so one of the things I've come to realize is that you all have ongoing questions. And a couple of questions I wanted to address that have come through the emails from, po from people to help frame a little bit of some of the things that are going on for folks. There was two that kind of had similar overview and it was basically, how do we, what's the best way to manage upwards to encourage authentic, authentic attention to culture and people? So I think particularly in COVID, this has been an interesting question because 
when the pandemic hit, lockdown happened, the shift came, first of all, to logistics. What does this mean? How is this going to affect our business? How are we going to respond to it? And it was very much a strategic operational response, followed pretty quickly after that with a well-being conversation. And now the conversations are getting a little bit more extended going, well, okay, this is indefinite. Uh, we're going to have to make some long-term decisions about how we run the business. How does that affect our operations? And then how does it affect our culture? Now, if you have a leadership team uh, that is only focused on strategy and logistics, you're missing half the piece of the puzzle. So if you are not on the executive team or you're a member of it and don't necessarily have positional authority on it, this is what you can do. So this is a little bit of influencing up um, strategies. The first one is in any sort of case for, hey, you should be paying more attention to culture, uh, always couch your suggestions in the language that is important to them. This is a general influence principle in, uh, across the board, whatever the topic. Always use language that is meaningful to the person you want to influence. In this case, if you have an executive team that is obsessed with uh, results and operations, talk about culture through that lens. Um, you want to be using things like results, metrics, productivity, and outcomes in any conversation around culture. Um, so here's an example of how you might do it. Um, and it's about reading an article. <laughs> here's one way to influence. It's a little surreptitious, slightly indirect. Um, and you could say something to one or more of them saying, I read this article on Gallup. This is a true story. It's a true link. I can give you the links after if you want them that shows increases engage in engagement, employee engagement result in two and a half times revenue growth. That's quite extraordinary. Two and a half times revenue growth and 40% less churn just by boosting employee engagement statistics. That's kind of mind blowing, isn't it? It's like, if we just spend a little bit of effort on employee engagement, we could increase our revenue two and a half times and reduce turnover by 40 per, by 40%. Wow. Those are kind of interesting statistics that a uh, strategic uh, um, logistically focused executive team would be interested in. Uh, so you make a suggestion. I think if we focus a little bit more on engagement and culture. We could get some of that goodness. <laughs> we could get a huge return. Um, and even this, here's another statistic that you could use. Showing appreciation results in 69% of employees working harder. That's a no cost, virtually no time strategy to increase productivity. So I think by sharing those kinds of data points is really useful to help influence. Now, data is just one point, stories are another. So if you're going to be influencing, you need both left brain, which is facts, statistics, and right brain, which are stories. And so what you want to couple this is a story about an organization that spent a lot of time on logistics and then switch to focusing on employee engagement and what their results were. Um, so you might have to do a little groundwork with that in terms of your influencing. So that is a big picture overview of how you want to help try and steer the ship to pay attention to some of the culture issues. The other thing I would keep in mind too is to talk about the Pareto's principle, you know, meaning that if you spend 20% of your time on culture and people engagement strategies, it'll give her give 80% return on effort and produce 80% of the results that you're after. Uh, so it doesn't need to be 50% culture and 50% strategy in terms of time spent on these things. A little bit means a big difference. Spending no time on culture and people will create 80% of your problems. <laughs> and I think that's a guaranteed. So I think there's, there's ways of influencing. Um, I sense a little bit of frustration behind these questions and I think that's, that, can be, that can be difficult to handle if you don't have authority within an organization. So influencing up is always about telling the story with the, with the statistics and inviting a conversation to help them look better. Uh, so influencing up is always about how do you make your boss, your supervisors look better. <laughs> so I'll leave it at that. That's a kind of a bigger question. Hopefully that helped. I look forward to your feedback around that question. Um, Another question came through, which was, do you think corporate rules and policy reflect a hidden hiring problem or culture problem within an organization? Uh, yes, 
So not necessarily problem, but systems drive behavior. And if that behavior is good or bad, depends on how good or bad the systems are. And underneath the system are the values that created them. So if you're trying to change problematic behavior or reinforce good behavior, you look to the systems that are creating that behavior and the values that underpin them. So sometimes if you want to do culture change, you really have to go to the layer of, of values first. That's what I do in the culture change programs that I do. We look at what are the values in the organization, the aspirational ones, like what do we aspire to be and what are, what are the real ones that we're operating by and are they serving us? And then we look at the systems and see how are the systems built on these values? Is there a synergy between that? Do some of the systems need to be adjusted to better reflect our aspirational values that we want to embed? And then we look at measuring the behavior outcomes as a result. So it's a, it's a big picture thing. It's not a quick, quick thing. Um, all right. And there was one last question that came through today from Cassia. Cassia, I will speak to this. I thought it was worth mentioning. Cassia's question was, uh, in generations at work, do generations have different beliefs? Where do they come from and how do you deal with it? I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> and when it comes to generations at work, there's been a lot written at, about Gen X, Gen Z, Gen Y, baby boomers, and how they can often be in conflict in terms of how they like to operate at work. My perspective on that is the conflicts that come from uh, different ages at work are more from stage of life than any particular characterization of a generation. And having said that, I think we also need to look at the age of each collection of people and what is the context from which they came. Because context drives values, which drives beliefs and perspective. So often we have conflicts of perspective and it's basically because where we've come from, what we've experienced to date, uh, shapes our lenses through which we see things and also our stage of life affects how we see and do things. So when I mentioned a little about this previously in, other, in the other webinars is that people are responding differently to the work at home order depending on their context and stage of life. Uh, so I think I mentioned previously that working moms are struggling the most with COVID work from home orders because they've often, this is a broad brush statement now, often they have to take on the responsibility of, edu of uh, homeschooling as well as domestic chores, as well as getting their work done. And the research is showing is that women have, are taking on more of the responsibilities across those three areas than their spouses are. Um, so they are enjoying the work from home a lot less than many others because they don't get a break. Going to an office place was at least a change of space and place that got them a little bit of a break from that. Uh, the others that are not enjoying work from home as much as others are the younger generations whose social interaction came from their office colleagues. And so they miss the social interaction that comes from being in a workplace. And if you remember, if you're not in your 20s now, remember when you were in your 20s, how much dynamic social engagement you got from going to work. It was amazing. Uh, your friends, your colleagues, you learned together, you were progressing together, you celebrated together, and now that's kind of whoosh, diminished. Um, so there are lots of different generations at work in terms of how what's driving their different perspectives. I think as leaders, we need to dig into that a little bit more if we're gonna manage people effectively, as well as manage the conflicts that can come up from that. So instead of people saying, you know, those Gen Ys are just, um, so feel so entitled um, as a broad generalization that's been in the media for ages, it's like, what's going on for them? Why do they feel like they should be given more opportunities? Is, do they, are they capable of doing that? What kinds of conversations do we need to have from different perspectives in order to get people on at least understanding where each other's are coming from. And this is advanced leadership skills, by the way. This is not what bread and butter leaders do. Uh, having conversations about perspective is a sophisticated, advanced um, ability, and not everybody's ready for it. So you need to gauge where you're at and also where your team's at in terms of raising those issues. Um, anything you can do to help people walk in another person's shoes 
works or works a little bit. <laughs> so that's the kind of core objective when it comes to sharing perspective. So th thank you very much for those questions. I hope that was helpful for you. I certainly enjoyed pontificating about it and thinking about how we can uh, respond to those particular situations. So moving now into COVID challenges in particular. So some of the ongoing lingering challenges that people are reporting to me are the never ending task list. This is like a perennial problem for leaders, not just a COVID one. Um, they, leaders often struggle and feel like, am I progressing? Am I being successful? Because as soon as I finish one thing, there's just another thing or m multiple things piling up on my plate. COVID added whole new layers of complexity onto all of that. Um, the other lingering problem, and which causes a bit of malaise and sort of uh, deflation, not depression necessarily, but kind of like, uh, I don't know how you describe, uh, but that <laughs> is that we're working hard. Are things getting any better? Um, so first of all, hats off to everyone in Melbourne. Congratulations on zero cases and zero deaths overnight. That is such good news for everyone. We're very happy that that's happened for you. And that feels like it feels like, thank goodness, you know, three months of lockdown, we're at least getting something, some sort of progress there. The other lingering question when it comes to COVID culture is like, are we working on the right things? It's kind of like, how, are we working on the right things? Do we have the right strategy? There's a lot of doubt around it because there's so much uncertainty still out there. And that's kind of deflating as well. Um, feeling isolated is another struggle that's ongoing. We have to make deliberate attempts and deliberate efforts to connect with folks. And it seems like there's no end point. All of us are hanging out for the vaccine. <laughs> In the meantime, we got to keep carrying on. So those are kind of the crappy ongoing challenges. And there might be some other ongoing challenges that you're facing. And a lot of you have answered a lot of those questions um, as we've gone along on this particular series. I want to talk about some solutions now. Yay, solutions! And being an energy broker is one of the solutions that you can use, particularly through COVID and ongoing. So this is a strategy that is effective leadership when it comes to galvanizing positivity in your team. So I'm going to share this model with you. And in your notebooks, uh, you have the shape of it to begin with. So let's get going on this. So the strategy is to become a biochemical drug dealer, which I think is hilarious. <laughs> um, yes, we're going to be a drug dealer in biochemicals. Uh oh, I've got to admit Frank. Hang on a second. Just have to stop sharing that for a second. Here we go. All right. So when we are being a biochemical drug dealer, our context and leadership is this. We are always balancing between task and team. It's what I was discussing before about the questions around the executive team. Too much focus on task versus not enough on team is often a struggle we have in leadership. We need to balance it, not equally in time, but definitely some focus across those areas. We also need to balance quality work with energy at work. Now, this combination actually has positive outcomes for uh, morale and enthusiasm at work if we handle it, handle it well. So the first one is when we balance high energy with a task orientation, the biochemical that comes as a result is endorphins. <laughs> endorphins you might know as the biochemical that occurs when we exercise. So when we put out a lot of output, we run a race, or we do anything supercharged like that, we get that feel good endorphin rush. It's a natural, um, it's the body's natural painkiller. So it helps us feel alive and invigorated. And that work, the way that we get endorphins is by reaching deadlines. So meeting and meeting deadlines or exceeding uh, targets or rushing to get something done or working on a really tough task. Uh, so that's where we can get endorphins. And if we set up our work well for ourselves and for our teams, we can capitalize on this. You know, it's like, it's sort of like, right, we're all in this together. We've got this big project to occur, to get across the line. Let's bog in and get it done. Um, so that's kind of a 
fun, uniting kind of opportunity. And we can be deliberate in this instead of reactive with it. The next biochemical that is task oriented is one where we focus on task and the quality of it. And the biochemical that we get as a result is dopamine. Dopamine is oh, it's very addictive. That's the first thing. And it feels amazing. So dopamine is what we feel, that little sense of satisfaction when we find something that we've lost. So I found a pair of sunnies the other day when I was cleaning, I was doing some decluttering. I found a pair of sunnies I didn't even remember I'd lost. I'm like, yeah, it's like a win. I'm like, yes. <laughs> and the satisfaction of tidying a drawer, yes, dopamine. The satisfaction of deleting and finishing emails, ugh, dopamine. Whenever you write a task list and tick something off of it, it's like that satisfying tick. Mm. That's dopamine. It's also what we get when we gamble. So the, the energizing anticipation of will I win or won't I is all dopamine. That's why gambling is so addictive. It hooks our dopamine systems. It's why social media is so addictive. All those little notifications. So if you have your emails open on your screen while you're working on something and you can see that little whatever it is in your system, mine's a little blue highlighter saying three new messages. You're like, Vroom! Your attention goes to what are those three messages? Who could, be, who could be emailing me? What exciting piece of news will be in that email? You may not say this verbally in your head, but this is the feeling that arises like, ooh, that curiosity. And then you go and deal with it. It's like dopamine, dopamine, dopamine. So email and social media is one of the reasons why we're getting hijacked. Our focus is getting hijacked. So there's a positive attribute to this because when we use our dopamine systems, it encourages us to keep showing up at work and doing stuff. <laughs> so it's a productivity enhancer. Now, both endorphins and dopamine are feel good and they have a downside. If that's all we do, they drain our body and they affect our immune system. So we actually need to reboot. We need to allow downtime from this stuff. And the problem is, and this is the other reason, the other thing you can share with your executive in terms of balancing task versus team, is that all, if all we do is task-oriented activities, we will have burnout. Uh, we will have, um, well, basically burnout is the big one because people just get fried. So we need to balance it out with team-oriented activities because the biochemicals on the other side of the quadrant reinvigorate the nervous system and the immune system. And those biochemicals feel really good too. So they just have a different energy to them. So when we talk about high energy and um, interaction with the team, we're talking serotonin. So these are all your recognition type of activities. So your celebration type of activities. So when you give one-on-one -on -one appreciation, that's serotonin, that sense of well-being, that sense of self-esteem. When you see somebody graduate, say, for example, that sort of like feeling of pride on their behalf, that's serotonin. And it's really powerful. It doesn't, happen to it doesn't even have to happen to you for you to feel it. You can observe somebody else getting an award, getting acknowledged, and you feel like, oh, that's really nice. <laughs> um, that's why some commercials can hook your emotional systems because they're, they're sharing those great moments in life. I'm thinking like a toilet paper ad for some reason. I don't know why toilet paper came to mind. Um, why you'd be having toilet paper celebrating graduations, I don't know, but <laughs> there you have it. And you have those little uh, phone phone call companies do these best, right? Those sort of touching moments of intimacy and, and connection and recognition, Psh, serotonin. So how we do recognition and appreciation boosts the serotonin. And the, the last one is all about intimacy. And oxytocin is the love and trust biochemical in teams. It's how we build strong relationships and it's how we feel safe, that whole sense of belonging. So the work we do as leaders is about how do we help people to feel included? How do we create psychological safety in our teams? How do we acknowledge people's place and reassure them that they, they are part of the team and that they have an identity as part of the team? So as leaders, we want to be dealing in these biochemicals um, all the time. We want to be conscious and deliberate about it, COVID or not, working from home or not. So if we have remote teams, we still need to do this biochemical dealership, if you like, we just do it with different tools. Instead of defaulting to gathering in person when we can't, we gather virtually. 
and we can do it electronically. It doesn't always have to be through video. Uh, we can pick up the phone, we can use our internet, etc. So I'm going to press pause and get you to answer in the chat box, which biochemical do you naturally default to? Like some of us have different home zones that we enjoy. Some of us are like dopamine. Yes, I love the dopamine. Some are, of us are endorphins. Yeah, give me a big project and something to push for all the time. Some of us are all about serotonin. Yep, I love watching people get celebrated or being celebrated myself. And some of us are all about that strong connection with individuals. So in the chat box, share, share which biochemical is your preferred, def preferred default. That's a bit of uh, hyperbole. So which one is your one that you prefer? I'll just stop sharing that for a second. And check out what you guys have got to say. Uh, are these covered in my book, People Stuff? Yes, Raj, the biochemicals are in People Stuff. Ooh, okay. So we've got oxytocin from Josie. Serotonin from Raj, endorphins from Cassia, endorphins from Russell, oxytocin, endorphins from Jamal, trying to move to oxytocin. <laughs> That's polar opposites, right? So how do you go from fast pace to one-on-one -on -one intimacy? Endorphins. Okay. So it's really good to know what your default is because you will naturally find it easier to lead in those particular areas of leadership. If endorphins is your thing, you're going to find it easy to go, right, let's go. Big project ahead, big task ahead, deadline looming. Woohoo! And it energizes you. It doesn't necessarily energize everybody in the same way. Be mindful that you don't just become one biochemical heavy. Uh, same thing with dopamine. If you're just a slow, deliberate, intentional work way through something, don't assume everybody else likes that too. Some people, like me, are a little bit more scattered. <laughs> <laughs> we get stuff done, but maybe not in the linear sequential mode. So I had a big conversation with my husband about our differences. We are polar opposite on everything. Every profiling instrument tool that we've taken, we're the opposites. And um, he just finds it amazing. <laughs> I don't find him so difficult to understand, but he finds me quite difficult to understand, I think, from time to time. Uh, because he believes his way is the best way. <laughs> I think we all have a bit of that, right? So even though we're tolerant for others, we always think my way is the best way. He's just a lot more overt about it. <laughs> so we need to make sure that we account for everybody in our team, not just our own defaults. Okay, so what we're going to do now is talk about the systems that generate the positive behaviors that we want, and they are aligned to being the biochemical drivers. So it's not just like try and make it up. There are specific specific why is that word so hard to say? Specific things that you can do in systems that can help generate these kind of biochemicals. That's exciting, right? I'm excited by this. <laughs> okay, going back to this. All right. Okay, so let's go through the systems and you can pick up, these are getting into the nitty gritty of things that you can do. So the system that drives endorphins uh, in a positive way, I've already mentioned some of them, you know, deadlines, projects, etc. The big one is decision making. So you can energize people in an endorphin way by being very careful how you craft your decision making. You want it to be co-creative, uh, which means that you don't just assign people stuff, you get them engaged in setting their own targets, their own objectives, um, and collaborating on that. You wanna be extremely transparent in your decision-making and you wanna emphasize we're in this together. So you can create decision-making as an opportunity to not only boost team morale, uh, boost team identity, and really leverage that kind of endorphin type thing. So how you do decision-making is pretty important. Um, so the key takeaway here is if you do unilateral, you must do this, you're on the wrong track. <laughs> If you do this, what can we do together? You're on the right track. So decision-making around projects, goal, objectives is a critical one that you can master, particularly in the pandemic situation because people are feeling isolated. To get them involved in conversations like this is really, really powerful. So the next one 
is delegation and delegation can really help you capitalize on the dopamine system. Um, we're going to talk about how to do delegation more effectively in just a moment. We're going to take a bit of a deeper dive on this one. But the point here is one of the things you need to be mindful of here in the delegation system is induction and training. So sometimes when people are underperforming and they're kind of, they look like they're lazy sometimes, it's, it's not that they're unmotivated, but they may not have the skills they need to in order to execute on the things that you've given them. And they may not have the skills to actually address the issues. So they kind of just flop around the outside and they miss out on getting dopamine in sense of progress because they're just not able to communicate or to actually uh, perform itself. So you might have to do a skills audit and more induction here. And delegation is a really important skill to help set you up for effective dopamine uh, harnessing. And we'll come back to that. We're going to talk about flow in relation to that in just a moment. The third one, kind of alluded this, is the system of promotions and recognition. Big ones. You want these to be transparent uh, so that people understand what they need to do in order to be recognized and promoted. You want to have formal rituals uh, to celebrate and acknowledge people. Uh, these can be end of year celebrations. Oh, I've got somebody else in the waiting room. Hang on. Just one second. Here's Stuart. Okay. Uh, you want to have, where was I? Formal rituals, end of year, employee of the month type of things that create opportunities for celebration. You can actually do this from the ground up. So you can talk to your team members. How do they want to be recognized? How often can you have conversations like this? And they may be shy about it. So you want to nudge the conversation along. And some people prefer to be recognized privately and some people like it publicly. I'm a gold star in public kind of girl. So any public recognition totally works for me. And for many, that is not the case. They get embarrassed. They only want to keep it private and confidential. Uh, in any case, this promotions and recognition is super, super important. The other thing that you can do to help boost serotonin is to make progress visible. And we're going to do a deep dive on that in just a moment. So we're going to do a deep dive on delegation and making progress visible in just a second. Let me go back to my model, finish him off, finish it off, I should say. Okay. All right, the fourth system is induction and culture management. And this is super, super important. Oh, I've got induction in the wrong place on the other one. Um, <clears throat> Induction is a way that you bring people into your team or into your organization. This is a really important touch point, and you can read about touch points in Chip and Dan Heath's book called Moments. And there's particular moments that we look to as being peak moments in a, in a workplace. And when we start is one of them, when we leave is another. So we want to make sure that our initial engagement with people is super, super important. And even in a COVID related blended teams, remote working, we can do induction really, really well. In fact, I was just writing an article for HR magazine about this, is that this is an opportunity for HR to innovate. So how can you make an induction experience fantastic, even if you can't come into a workplace? Well, you do it virtually, of course, you send them a package, you send them things that are branded, that they feel part of the team. So when we do that, like when we brand our teams, it creates a sense of inclusion and belonging. And that's super, super important. So any new employee should get a package of stuff with your brand on it. Uh, so my team gets, of course, they get all my books. They get a mug. I don't have my people stuff mug here. Darn it. <laughs> that would have been a good display. Um, they get journals and uh, they get everything with inner compass on it. And it's a way of saying you're part of the club, the tribe, the operation that gets this thing delivered. And my amplifiers groups gets exact same stuff. So they get all of my books, they get an amplifiers book, they get an amplifiers handbook. And it's my way of welcoming them to the experience of being an amplifier. So induction and culture management is super, super important. Okay, so 
four systems, decision-making, delegation, promotion, recognition, induction, and culture management, which is your strongest system? Pop that in the chat box. Which is your strongest system? So you've got decision-making, delegation, promotion, induction. Let's see what you guys have got to say about that. Oh, you want me to reshare my screen? Okay, I'll bring up that model again so you can see it. Okay, so there's the model. Can I see the chat box at the same time? I can, that's exciting. Okay, so not sure, decision-making, decision-making, delegation, decision-making, okay, lots of task ones. <laughs> okay, so which is your weakest system? Weakest system. Pop that in the chat box. Okay, weakest one. Let's have a look. Induction and culture, induction, promotion, recognition. Yeah, I had a hypothesis about this, that the strong ones would be the task side and the weak ones would be the team. Hypothesis confirmed, unfortunately. Good news is, now that you know that, you can improve things, uh, which is awesome. Okay, so what I wanna go through now is a little bit on the delegation and a little bit on making progress visible, which is, um, <clears throat> which one was that one? making progress visible is promotion and recognition. Okay, so we're gonna look at dopamine and serotonin, deep dive. Here's the dopamine one, and this is a quick win. If you haven't come across this model before, it is by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi. Took me forever to learn how to say his name. How would you be even to guess that? His name's there on the bottom left-hand side of the screen. Um, so here we've got his model. Chick sent me high, said that people operate best when there's a balance of skill and challenge. If there's a high challenge and low skill, people are anxious. They've got something they've got to do and they just don't have the skill to do it. That's really scary. Uh, it's not good. If we have a lot of skill and the challenge is really low, we're just bored. Both those, those areas are ripe for disengagement. The balance comes when the challenge is just right, the Goldilocks zone against the skill. So when you are delegating, it's important that you are assessing what is the skill level and the challenge level of this thing that I'm going to delegate to someone. Uh, do they have enough skill in order to engage with it? Uh, do they have, is it enough challenge to keep them interested? Maybe you need to amp up the ante, give them more responsibility. And then you can get into this little Goldilocks zone. And that's sort of where the engagement zone is. What happens when we're in flow is this whole dump of biochemicals. You get everything. You get dopamine, norepinephrine. You get ananatomide, which is a biochemical that helps us uh, recognize patterns. Um, and then when we're in this flow zone and we're doing this work that's engaging all of our senses and we're deeply focused, at the end of that, we have this deep sense of satisfaction and we feel awesome. And that's, we get a little rush of serotonin and oxytocin at the end. It's amazing. So we know we're in flow when we lose sight of the time, when we feel completely absorbed in what we're doing, things feel, we feel enormously creative and productive. We are enormously creative and productive uh, at the end of it. So each of us has probably felt like that from time to time. The work that I've done with amplifiers this quarter has been about how to be in that flow zone the majority of your time at work and how to recover from it because after such a big uh, chemical dump, it can be a little exhausting. So as biochemical drug dealers, you can use your delegation system to hook the dopamine for good, not evil. So get them off emails and social media and into doing a task that is the right challenge for their skill. So you might need to increase skill or increase challenge or a bit of both. So you're doing that as a leader, hey, you're kicking major, major goals. So the other system I want to go through uh, is this one, is the promotion and recognition one, specifically on how you make progress visible. So high tactics. 
By the way, we're probably not going to go to chat rooms today because I had so much content I wanted to make sure you guys got before we ended this series. Um, okay, so next one, how to make progress visible. Making progress visible was one of the most important strategies that I read about when it comes to getting in flow. So part of getting to flow is having specific goals that you can obtain, obtain uh, getting feedback as to whether or not you're actually progressing towards that. Making progress visible was a key part of understanding if you're getting closer or not. And it was something that was highlighted by Dr. Jason Fox in his book, The Game Changer. And it's about how to apply gamification principles to uh, employee engagement and motivation at work. Really cool book. Um, so making progress visible, how do we do that? Well, thank you for asking. We're going to find out. Here is an example of making progress visible. This is an XMR chart, which is a graph essentially. And it's XMR because there's a lower level um, and a higher level. And in between you're plotting data points. <laughs> and what you're looking for are trends. So one of the biggest mistakes that organizations and leaders make is that they only look at points and not patterns. XMR charts like this tracks patterns and not just points because you can have spikes in data like the big 12 that's circled there and you think woohoo we're doing extremely well and then bango your next data points are below par and you get deflated so when you track the patterns you can see whether in your a normal range or whether you're improving or declining now in this graph you got the red line at the bottom in which case you've had five data points below the norm uh, in the lower range which indicates things are getting worse if you had five data points going upward trend, things are getting better. So this is really useful in order to track to see if we are improving or declining. It's, let me just do a comparison. So, you know, you get on the scales every morning and it gives you a number. <laughs> that number may feel good or may feel bad, depending. It's only important depending on which way it's tracking. If every day the number is going up and that is something that you do not want, maybe something that you do want. If it's something you do not want, then after five data points over a period of time, whether it's this numbers over five week period of time, it's probably logical for weight tracking. If it's still going up, Houston may have a problem. If the data points are tracking down over the five week period, you're on track. But the daily variability is distracting. So this is one way of making progress visible that is useful and helps get a sense of um, satisfaction in our work. Here's another one, progress bars. How far are you through your project? <laughs> so they use progress bars in shopping carts to hook you to go to the next step because you just wanna complete the dots on this, right? And if you think about it, you know, a Tim Tam box, it's got a row, I don't know how many, how many are in a Tim Tam box? Is it 10? I think it's 10, isn't it? 10, oh, was that eight, Cassia? Okay, eight, eight Tim Tams in a box. So if you eat two of those, well, you're halfway, you're a quarter way through a progress bar, you just basically need to keep eating until you finish that progress bar. So it's one way of hooking your dopamine system. Um, it's also another way to hook your oxytocin and serotonin system saying, oh, I'm progressing, that's awesome. Here's another sort of progress bar chart. This is comparative analysis, really useful. How are we tracking in our different projects? And this one, thermometer, how far are we from our target? So you can see like, oh, we're at 22,000. Oh, we're nearly at 32,000. You just want to add the extra 10K to hit it. Um, this is another way of making progress visible from the wonderful Lynn Kazali is to make your journey visible. So she's, she's an amazing illustrator and she's tracked out how you can make your plan. Let's say your strategic plan for the next quarter. You can do this one, two, three, four. What are the things that we need to do along the way? And you just make it a visible pathway. Uh, if you don't feel like you have great illustration skills, you can go basic like this. How fun is that? And you feel like when you go from one blob to the next, you're actually making your way through something. Here's another one, road or, or river progress. You can use this to draw things out with your team. Where are we, where are we going to next? 
And when we get to each bend or uh, thing in the river, we can celebrate. That is making progress visible. So let's see when we can apply this. And in your notebooks, I have this. If you want to show improvements, use your XMR chart. If you want to show completion, use a progress bar or progress bar. I'm not sure which way is Australian, which way is not Australian. Show your goal amounts, use a thermometer. And the last one, show project milestones, roadmap, river, etc. How cool is that? Oh, I'm so excited for you. I want to see all of your progress bars and, and river journals to help you track um, how, how you can track progress. Okay, now where are we get up to? All right, we went through that. Okay, some mistakes. Okay, stop sharing. You can look at me now. Mm, hello. Um, some mistakes I see people making with any of this. You write goals as actions not as results. Makes sense, right? Well, typically when we write a task list, we just write actions. And we think we're achieving, but it's a delusion. It can be a distraction also, if we don't link those tasks to end results. So what is it the thing that we'll see, feel, do, experience at the end of all this activity? We need to have that clearly defined. And I turn you to Stacy Barr's work uh, bar B A R R and key performance measurement. Everyone should do their KPIs based on her work. It is phenomenal and it is useful and is really effective. Most other KPI methodologies are terrible. <laughs> so there you go. Make sure you define your results and not just your tasks. Uh, the other mistake I see people make with this is that the only thing they have to measure progress is the task list. It's only one sign of progress. And yes, it does feel good to tick things off, but it makes more sense to have a roadmap that you can mark things off as you go. Another mistake is not measuring your results. So you wanna measure your impact, not just the fact that you did stuff. So you wanna have measures that quantify or qualify the results that you're trying to produce and track that. Big mistake number four, not celebrating. It's so easy to do this. And it's so unnatural. People say, ah, we've got time for that fluffy stuff. That fluffy stuff gives you serotonin and is really super important. So find ways to celebrate that are meaningful to you and your team. Not everybody likes celebrations in the same way. Most people don't like mandated fun. Um, like you must meet at 6 p.m. for group drinks. <sighs> <laughs> so find something that's meaningful to everybody, you know, and it doesn't have to be a big ta-da unless you're a big ta-da kind of group. So that's mistake number four. Mistake number five is not doing anything with what you've learned. So you've turned up the last three weeks to either listen to the recording or to be live with me. And if you don't do anything with this, that makes me very sad and disappointed and more you won't be getting the benefits of what you've learned. So find at least one thing to implement that you've discovered over the last three weeks and have a go, experiment with it. So we've got a couple minutes left and 10 minutes. And what I wanna do is make sure that you cover off on some of the important questions I've left you in your workbooks. And those are about legacy and a vision for your leadership. So one of the things I think is really important to know about the pandemic is how we operate through the pandemic will be the making and breaking of our leadership legacy. If we are concerned about our legacy, we got a problem, <laughs> ironically, it's a paradox because those who are concerned about their legacy are too much focused on themselves and not enough focused on others. So if you're doing stuff to ensure your legacy, you're wrongly motivated. And at the same time, it's a nice positive reinforcement to know that if we do the right thing and do well by other people, that we will have a nice legacy. But that's not the fundamental purpose of why we wanna do things. To help guide us though, there's a set of questions that we can start to explore. And the ones that I've given you in your workbook are um, some of the questions I've posed to the amplifiers who are gathering next week in their immersion to help them get set up for the summer immersion that's coming up on Project You, the leader. These are really important. So 
I want you to have a think about these, whether you come onto amplifiers or not, these are really powerful ones. What is your compelling vision for the kind of leader you want to be? I think this is real soul searching stuff. And I think when we have an answer to that, it helps guide our choices afterwards. Having a look at who your role models are and why they're role models to you is another way of getting clear on what's important to you as a leader. This one here is really useful. How am I a better leader today than I was a year ago? Hopefully you are a better leader. I'm sure you are. <laughs> what level of performance do I aspire to have? So that's being concrete in your results that you want to achieve as a leader. This one's a tough one. And you might have to actually ask some colleagues with this is what's my reputation as a leader? What reputation do I want? That's one for you. And what's my brand? What am I known for? If you don't know, ask other people about it. Um, they, other people are really good sources of information. They put up a mirror for you. And even though it sounds weird to ask people these questions, you can say, I was tasked with this by an executive coach. <laughs> it's a professional development opportunity. Please help me. And people are actually generally receptive when you ask them questions like that. And the last one is what, contribu what, what contribution will I make? What contribution will I make? Through this pandemic and beyond, what contribution will I make to my team, to the organization, to the community? These are kind of big questions. And if we don't navigate our leadership based on these questions, we're kind of just bumbling along. So it's worth spending some time and energy reflecting on these. So the biggest, the biggest calling I have for you is for you to become an amplifier. And I mean that by what that means, not necessarily join my group. Though, of course, I want you to join my group if it's right and you're ready for it. Um, you'd be an awesome addition to my program, I'm sure. And we can have a conversation separately about it. So in being an amplifier, I want to show a little bit of what I mean by that. So you can track how you might find yourself along the way. Hang on. Ugh. Here we go. So in our leadership journeys, what I found is that people skills and perspective are two integral things to help us grow and develop and make an impact as a leader. If we don't have really strong people skills or a very wide perspective, we're basically agitators. And as agitators, we know we want to change things, but we don't necessarily know how to do it. It's kind of like the question, how do I influence the executive to do people's, to do culture stuff? We, we're agitated by this lack, but we don't necessarily have the right people skills to influence or the perspective holistically across the organization, maybe, in order to create a difference. If we do build up perspective and people skills, we move to what's an achiever. And this is kind of the quintessential level of leadership that we can tend to get to. And that's being able to bring a team together, produce results, get an outcome. And often we get stymied or stuck at this level. It's kind of the plateau in which we, we, we run up against. We, what we find here as an achievers is that our context changes. Things get more complex, more volatile, more uncertain, like COVID has pushed us to, pushed us to the edge of our achieving abilities. And if we don't do something different, this is a critical shifting point, we can end up burning out and being a fader. So the idea here is if we don't learn how to lead differently, to be able to understand and navigate systems, uh, to understand culture, to understand and lead change, then we're going to fade out of our opportunity to impact and influence. If we do learn those skills, how to lead change, culture, strategy, and performance in a volatile, uncertain world, we can be amplifiers where we are amplifying results, not just in the organization, but in our community and beyond, where we are growing leaders ourselves. So it's not just up to us. We actually build capacity around us. We build leadership capacity around us. And we're actively contributing to a longer, bigger term picture. It's an exciting place to play. And it's what I invite you to come and share with us in the Amplifiers program. That's the critical shift little bit of an opportunity. So this is a quick overview of the program. We meet quarterly on a one day immersion. And if you're not in Canberra, we have a virtual uh, remote group as well. 
and we have quarterly themes on leading culture, leading change, leading strategy, and leading performance. We have a monthly webcast between immersions on the quarterly theme, which is about touching base with your colleagues, kind of like what we've been doing on this series, and to track and implement things differently. You get a book, a different book, each quarter, each year, it's something different and new. So our book for next quarter, Men's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. Many of you will have read this, so it's a little bit of an introspective big topic. There's a library of everything we've covered in, in amplifiers to date. So that's like a year and a half worth of wisdom right there. Um, we have a new WhatsApp channel for actually connecting with people and, and staying anchored to the community. And the community of like-minded leaders for support and sounding board is one of the most useful aspects of this program. You also get one-on-one -on -one coaching. I'm offering one-on-one -on -one coaching less and less as I do more team facilitation, strategy and culture facilitation. So this is one of the only places you can get one-on-one -on -one time with me and it's dedicated to you and specifically what's happening for you. So the investment, the whole value of the program I reckon is 33 grand. A 12 month membership uh, for the virtual crew is 82.50 including GST or you can do four payments of 27.15. And if you join now before the end of October, you get a whole extra quarter for free. So instead of four quarters, you can have five. <laughs> okay. And if you're not happy in the program, you can pull out at any time. We'll reimburse any of the costs you have not already consumed uh, immediately and let you go. Any unused portion of the program. And that's it. So I'm going to stop sharing that. That's a little bit of an overview of amplifiers. I will make invitations to folks to see if you want to talk more about that. Um, largely, I wanted to say thank you for each of you for being part of this. Uh, to spend an hour for a week, each week for three weeks, is a huge investment of your time. I really hope you've had some key takeaways. In the chat box, uh, it would be really helpful for me to see what was useful from today's session. Uh, in particular. I love bringing this content to you about being a biochemical drug dealer and the systems that you can play with to generate those biochemicals for positive outcomes. Um, so pop that into the chat box. If you want to stay around to have a quick chat with me afterwards, I'm hanging around until everybody's gone. You're more than welcome to, but I will look forward to who's saying what about what was awesome. <laughs> this is my way of getting serotonin, by the way, <laughs> and also to see what landed. Okay. Okay. The introspection between task and people stuff. Okay. So that's what Raj found useful from today. I'd love to hear what everybody else found useful. Oh my God. I don't think I, did I record? Yes, I did. Thank goodness. Mind snap right there. Mapping the journey. So easy, but easy to forget to do. I know, right, Simone? It's, it's so helpful to know that you can do that. Russell, focus more on team, not task. Yay, Russell. Recognize and celebrate achievements and downtime. Yeah, thank you, Frank. Solutions to navigate from one side to another. Yeah. Step up the visual tools. <laughs> yeah, you don't have to be a great illustrator to do it either, right? You just keep it super simple. Awesome. Biochemical model, eye-opening, particularly thinking around what we believe our strengths areas to improve mark. Simple but effective. Thank you, Kasia. You're welcome, Julie. Thank you. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording and wish you all well. Thank you for playing. You're all part of the Inner Compass community now. You are welcome to read my newsletters every week and listen to my podcast and stay part of the family for as long as you want, as long as you're finding it of value. So thank you so much for playing. <laughs>